in Genesis, we, we know that, that God created us in God's image, and then sin entered the picture and changed our condition. We, we still bear the image of God, but, but because of sin, we, we sort of have fallen asleep to it, and we, we, need, we need to be reawakened to, to, to that image of God, God intended for our lives to be. We see that God, by his mighty acts, is bringing salvation in, into our lives, and we see that as we journey with the people of God. So the first few weeks, we were looking at the call of God. The last few weeks, we have been looking at the deliverance, as we, we have been reading the stories of Moses. For this month, for, for the month of October, as we continue this journey, this series called Returning to the Image of God, today, for this month, we're going to focus on what that looks like in our lives as a community, as the community of God. So that's going to be our focus for this month of October. So here in this passage today, as we, we arrive in this passage in chapter 16, uh, for, for those who might have missed last week, so last week we were in Exodus 14, where, where the point where God sent Moses to send his people across the Red Sea, and God miraculously held back the waters so they could cross on dry ground. And then chapter 15 is this beautiful song, uh, the song of Moses. And now here we are in chapter 16, now that they're on the other side, and we see that, as I said earlier, now they, it's almost like they've forgotten. They're, they're, they're so hungry that all they see is what's before them, that they have lost sight and forgotten what God ha, has done for us. So, so today in this passage, we're, what we're going to see is that God provides for a sustainable community. God provides for a sustainable community. And next week when Phil is here, Phil Jameson, He's going to pick up in Exodus chapter 20, and we're going to see where God gives the, the Ten Commandments. And what we'll see next week is that God provides a means for a just community through, through the giving of, of the law. I want to put this before us for, to ponder during this time this morning. What if, what if God's desire for our lives is not simply to survive but to thrive. What would that look like in our day-to-day -day lives? I want you to ponder that in your heart this morning. And then ask yourself, am I living to survive or am I living to thrive? <coughs> you see, friends, in order to thrive, God through the Holy Spirit is changing our very desire. See, that, that's what it takes. That's what we're, we're getting at today is, is what is it that we are hungering after? What is it that is the, the desire that is causing, that is leading our lives? Because, you know, we, we follow that which we desire. That's what we're going to go after. So I want to ask this morning, are you desiring the things of God in your life this morning? I want to encourage us to think about that this morning. What does that look like? In our lives, I was struck by um, Terence Fretum's commentary. I like the way he puts this in just one sentence. He, he kind of puts it in a little theological package of what, what is at the heart of, of this lesson in, in this Old Testament lesson. He says this for the people of God that the, their lack of discernment of God's presence in the ordinary leads to a denial of God's presence in the extraordinary. Let me say it again. The lack of discernment of God's presence in the ordinary leads to a denial of God's presence in the extraordinary. You see, what has happened is they, they've gotten to a place where all they see is, is what, what do they have to do to survive today? That, that, they, that they forget that the God who who just parted the waters of the Red Sea and is leading them by a fire at night and a cloud by day, is with them. And he didn't just bring them out of bondage and across the Red Sea for them to die. 
So they're so focused on their hungry, on their hunger, that they forget God's miraculous deliverance. I want to suggest from this passage three ways in which our desires can be changed to hunger for the things of God. First of all, so we are returning to the image of God as a community of contentment. That's your first blank if you're taking notes. As a community of contentment. Look with me in verse 19, if you have your Bible with with you. And Moses said to them, let no one leave any of it over until the morning. Speaking of the, the manna. But they did not listen to Moses. Some left part of it until morning, and it bred worms and became foul. And Moses was angry with them. You see, their, their instinct, their desire was whenever, whenever food showed up, what was, to, was, to hold, was to hoard it. Because they may not have enough for, for tomorrow. So what we see here is that their, their desire to take care of tomorrow what was causing them to, to not be content for what they had today. You see, what, what is at the heart of, of discontentment is that we, we, we see things as, as if something is missing. Okay? Whenever we allow discontentment in our hearts, all that we are able to focus on and all that we're able to see is what we don't have. So much so that we, we forget all that we do have. And I want to encourage you today to find contentment in today. You see, as opposed to discontentment, contentment sees, sees value in everything. And even, even the little things. And it's, it's a reminder that God is present even in the most, uh, most ordinary things. God is with you this morning as you got in the car and came to church. God was with you then. And God is with you now. I like the way John Wesley says it. He, he comes up with some very interesting ways of putting things. In his notes on this passage, he says this, But discontent magnifies what is past, and vilifies what is present without regard to truth or reason. And none talk more absurdly than murmurers. None talk more absurdly than murmurers. Than murmurs. Those who complain. Now, whenever, we, whenever we're unable to find contentment in life, you know, we, we, we become what we don't want to be, don't we? We, we, we become that which that which we, we don't desire in our lives. So I want to encourage us today to, to find contentment. And secondly, we are returning to the image of God as a community of abundance. And that's your next blank. A community of abundance. Look with me in verse 21. So morning by morning, they gathered it, as much as each needed, but when the sun grew hot, it melted. You know, I remember back in my senior year in high school, Mr. Jimmy Haley's economics class. And I remember this as clear as I remember anything. The very first day of class, Mr. Haley, great teacher. I love Mr. Haley. Very good teacher. They had a love for students. Um, but he wrote on the first day of economics class this big word in all capital letters on the board. And that word, scarcity. The very first day of economics class, he began by telling us the way in which the world sees the economy is an economy of scarcity. What that means is, is that there is a limited supply. There is a limited supply, and we have to manage that limited supply if there's going to be enough. So it, the economy of our world is driven by that base approach of scarcity, as if there's not enough. But see, the economy of God's kingdom, though, is an economy that's based on abundance. Now, if you get a hold of this, it will completely change your whole way of being, your whole way of thinking. You see, friends, the way that God shows up here at, at this important moment 
is, is to try to teach them that if, if, they, if they hold on to stuff, what's going to happen is just, it's just going to decay. Because what that reveals is a wrongful desire of greed. And whenever we, whenever we allow discontentment and, and, and a way of thinking that is scarcity, then, then, our, then our inclination is to look inward instead of outward. And it makes us blind to new possibilities and new things. That's why I am so excited about this One Day of Hope event. I want to encourage you to please, please come. You will be blessed to be a part of it because this event is an inspiring event that proclaims that there is plenty in God's kingdom, that there is no shortage of supply in God's kingdom. I want to encourage you to come and you'll see it, see it for yourself. So, and lastly, we are returning to the image of God as a community at rest. It's interesting in this passage that God instructs his people that on the sixth day is the only day that they're allowed to have extra because there won't be any on, on the seventh day, which will be a Sabbath day. And keep in mind, this is before the giving of the, of the, of the law. This is before the giving of, of the Ten Commandments. So Sabbath, taking time to rest, is very important to God. And it's something that is a gift of God to us. Sometimes we, we forget it, and we don't always approach, approach it that way. But it, it, it's a gift. I like the way that Augustine puts it. Augustine says this. This is my favorite quote of his. You've probably heard me say it before. Augustine says this, that our hearts are restless until they rest in God alone. Oh, isn't that so true? Until we are able to put our whole trust in God, that God is faithful every day, our hearts are continually going to be restless. I have a little thing that I keep in, in my prayer guide uh, that I, I borrowed from a book called The Emotional Healthy Church from Peter Scazzaro. And it says this, and I try to look over this every day when I pray in my prayer time to remind me to take time to be restful through the day, to be aware of what God is doing. And here's what it says. I know I'm off-center when I'm anxious. I know I'm off-center when I am rushing or hurrying or when my body is in a knot. Or I, how about this one? I'm doing too many things and my mind cannot stop racing. I try to keep this list before me every day and keep a check on those things. And, and if I feel myself being too busy or getting in a hurry, take time and see what God is doing around me. Because you see, we, we all, I think, have a tendency to feel as if this whole world depends on whether or not I'm busy and doing this next thing. And what God is trying to teach us is that he's got this. We just need to sometimes slow down. And isn't it so hard to do that sometimes? To just, to just slow down. Take a moment. Trust that God is here in this moment. There's a couple of books that um, I've, I, I'm, I'm spending some time reflecting on. Um, the same author, um, these two books by Alan Fadling. The first is called An Unhurried Life, Following Jesus' Rhythms of Work and Rest. And the second one is a sequel called An Unhurried Leader, The Lasting Fruit of Daily Influence. You see, I, I pray that God would inspire me to be the kind of leader that recognizes what God is doing. And, and, and that I not rush past that which God is, is trying to lead us into. And in, in the book, An Unhurried Life, he faddling quotes Henry Nowen saying this. Nowen said, our task is to help people concentrate on the real but often hidden event of God's active presence in their lives. And he goes on to say that it is it is hearing the voice of God in the quiet that enables us to live and to work well. 
That's what it's all about. folks. If, if we can hear God's voice in the midst of all our activity, that is what gives our life its deepest meaning. You know, I don't want to live in such a hurry that I miss what God's doing. I was just reminded of it this week. Friday, I had the privilege and the opportunity to go with um, our older son, Elijah, on his school field trip to the Nashville Zoo. You know, and I'll be honest, it was one of those weeks where things have been kind of piling up for me, and man, there's so much I've got to do right now. But I said, no, I've made this commitment. People are counting on me. I've got to do this. And you know what happened? When I got there, and as we went through the day, I got to watch my son interacting with his friends and seeing his closest friends that, that, that are influencing him and that he is influencing and, and to watch them interact. And I stopped and, mo- and thought to myself, wow, I don't want to miss this. And it, it made me realize how important that moment is and how often, you know what, I just... Sometimes I just need to slow down. Slow down and open my eyes and see what is before me right now in this moment. In church, I want to encourage us to do the very same thing. You know those Tuesday morning fellowships that Brother Johnson won't let me play at the rook table anymore? (laughs) And, (laughs) And all those dominoes players that gang up on me? You know what? That's sacred time. Even in those ordinary things, guess what? God is is there. And it's the relationship that we're building. God's doing something in our lives. I don't want to miss it. Brother Mickey, I don't want to miss it whenever we're packing backpacks for the students at the school. When we're around that table and putting food in those bags and taking time to, to pray, God's doing something. And I don't want to just show up, and I don't want to just go through the motions, folks. It's too important. This summer, as we were out on the ball field, striking out, (laughs) missing pop-ups. Can I get an amen? (laughs) Even in those moments, God's doing something. We're building a community. And it's not what we're doing, it's what God's doing. And God is speaking, and he's saying to his people, slow down, slow down. Be content. There is abundance and rest. Today is World Communion Sunday, a date that was established in 1940 to call for unity in the churches. And in just a moment, we're going to come to the table. The table of Jesus is an invitation, folks, to come into this kingdom of God. To come into this kingdom where there is contentment, where there is abundance, and where there is rest. Will you come today? And I'm going to close the sermon with a prayer from our book of worship in observance of this special day. Let us pray. Oh God, we join with our sisters and brothers around the world in remembering Christ's sacrifice for us, for the opportunity to eat and drink together, and for the life we have received. We give you thanks and praise. In the abundance of your many gifts, grant us grace to fill one another's lives with love. Redeem, restore, and remold us until we are made new. Transform our daily bread into the bread of life. And the cup that we drink into the cup of salvation. We pray in Jesus' name, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. And the people of God said,